from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And although it's late in the day, we have saved the best for last. I had the privilege of introducing Lisa probably 15 years ago at a conference of the American Library Association. This was long before she'd had a string of bestsellers, long before her books had been published in many languages, long before she'd had 25 million copies of her books printed. Uh, so, it was, so it's quite an honor for me to be able to introduce her today. Lisa has really been doing double duty. Earlier today, uh, she made a presentation with her daughter, Francesca Saratella. And they talked about their book, Best Friends, Occasional Enemies, The Lighter Side of Life as a Mother and Daughter, um, which I can't wait to read. I should add that 15 years ago, when I introduced Lisa, her publisher ran out of her books, so I didn't get an autographed copy, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> Lisa is, uh, let's just face it, a brainiac. She graduated magna cum laude in three years from the University of Pennsylvania. She went on to get her JD also from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Today, we're gonna hear about her latest book, Come Home, a story about a mother who sacrifices her future for a child from her past. And I want to read you what David Baldacci said about this book. 300 pages bled through my hands, and I closed the book at 2 AM. If the sheer energy in Come Home could be bottled, the oil companies would be out of business. The suspense and dread builds like a series of tornadoes flattening all in their path. Need I say more? May I present Lisa Scottolini. Oh my God, you guys are so great. Girls are squealing. I'll try not to squeal into the microphone because very quickly you will understand why I'm divorced twice. Thank you for being here. Let's say some thank yous. First, thank you to all of you. God bless you. I appreciate you. If you know who I am and you've read me, I like you better than if you don't. <laughs> but above all, I like you for being here. And I want to thank, very seriously, all of the librarians at the Library of Congress. Right? Let's hear it. Dr. Billington on down. It is our biggest, bestest, most gorgeous, beautiful resource. As you probably know, because you are all Washington cognoscenti, you can go there anytime. But I am here to tell you that it is your library. Take a tour. You will be stunned and amazed. And above all, as I am so grateful, so grateful li for librarians everywhere, and I will begin by telling you why. I grew up in a wonderful, warm Italian household, lots of hugs, lots of meatballs, one book. What was the book? Take a guess. The Bible, aren't you sweet? No. No, this is me now, and I'm from Philly, and the book was TV Guide. There was not a single book in our house. We ate on TV trays. Are you impressed yet? Does it, please tell me it sounds just a little bit familiar. We were, you know, it just was not the kind of house that read. God bless my mother because she always said, stop reading, it'll ruin your eyes. And it did. Go out and play, and I didn't because I was addicted to books. I was that kid, so what happened was I found books in a school library of our elementary school. Any school librarians here? Love, love, thank you, grateful, hugs, also French kisses, come here. I'll force my tongue into your mouth. I owe you big time because it was a school librarian who said to my father, listen, 
your kid really loves books. You need to take her to the library. So he ga she gave my father a big list of libraries. We went to one. He took me. He sat in the car like a dog because there was no TV in the library. Now there's TV in the libraries. We had a shot at getting one of the flying Scottolinis inside, but no, there was me. And there I was wandering around the air-conditioned stacks. Now, if you're me and you don't know how to choose a book, I'm going to take you back just a little to the days. Please tell me you remember when you opened the back of a library book and there was a card that actually stayed with that library book. <laughs> Let's hear it for monogamy in lending libraries. And I, that's one way I chose. I would look at the signatures of the people. I know, right? And if they had nice handwriting, I would go, that might be a good book. Or if, if there were lots of signatures, and that was definitely a good book. And as it turns out, that is not the worst gauge, because after all, it's a bestseller. And I'm a big fan of, you know, that people aren't so damn stupid. And if a lot of people like it, it's either Spaghetti, Seinfeld, or a really good book. So I'm there. So that was one way I chose. Another way I chose, though, that was closer to my heart and more apropos, was that in my library, which was the Ballad Kinwood Library, who cares? I will tell you, though, I can remember today my orange library card. It had a little metal plate on it that had a number. The number was 3539. Why do I remember the number of my library card and not where my car is parked, where my keys are, my, you know what, I have two ex-husbands whom I call thing one and thing two. That's what I call them in polite company. So what I'm saying to you, I have a bad memory. But my library card, I remember, because the library meant so much to me. As a person who got this first piece of ID, I will tell you that I believe that the first piece of ID you get as an adult, do you remember when you wanted mail and a nice thick wallet full of plasticky cards and it had my name on it? And for me, it was about self-esteem. It was about being a part of a club because though they loved me to the marrow at home, they didn't really understand me and my reading habit. It was the library that understood me. It was the library that said, you read, therefore you matter to us. And that is why I owe librarians so much. And when we come to the time when I have to choose a book, it's why I have a career today. Because if I wasn't looking in the back of the library book, I was looking at the spine. Because at the spine of many a library books in my neighborhood, there was a guy with a really big nose. Now, Scottolinis have really big noses. My mother likes to say that we get more oxygen than anyone in the room. And she is absolutely, if I breathe in, you could die. It's over. But the truth is, the guy on the profile, because there was a profile at the bottom of the spine, and he had a really big nose, and I was feeling very Uncle Rocky about him. Like, he reminded me of my Uncle Rocky. So I'm like, I, I don't know what to pick. I'm going to start reading all these Uncle Rocky books. And then at some point, I learned that he wasn't Uncle Rocky or even Italian, but it's some guy named Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and I'm a mystery reader and writer and lover, and so are we all, right? It's, it's wonderful. These are books about love and hate and good and evil and justice and injustice and what is morally right and what is morally wrong and what is legally right and what is legally wrong and all of that, com that nexus of good thinking that I think intelligent people like to wonder about, even in the context of a good story, is in these books. I found them at an early age by the guy on the spine and he led me to someone whose name you know, Nancy Drew. Can we take a second to remember the girl detective? Right? Because if you contrast her with, let's say, a typical male protagonist like Jason Bourne, right? Because like I like to say, uh, I like to think about Matt Damon, so let's pause a minute. Okay. Matt Damon and Jason Bourne is very typical of a suspense protagonist. He can do anything, he's an expert. Lots of the, you know, he can speak any language, he can use any weapons, he can reverse a car at speed, don't come near me. 
cannot drive. In many ways, he is superhuman. He might as well be Spider-Man. They're wonderful books, but I never felt omnipotent. I felt like Nancy Drew, because what Nancy Drew has, no weapon, no special languages, no, nothing unusually technical except for, well, let me demonstrate. A magnifying glass. You have to be kidding me. How awesome is that? And using the magnifying glass and her God-given wits and moxie and heart and dint of sheer effort, she solves crime. She finds hidden staircases and various trinkets, tchotchkes nobody would ever want except in books. God loved Nancy Drew. And what's important about Nancy Drew for our purposes is when you, when you read anything, Think about the details the authors have chosen, because of course Nancy Drew has a good girlfriend, don't we all? Right? The person you can call and go, bring a hefty bag, I might have killed somebody, just a hypothetical. <laughs> come on, honey, come right over, no questions asked. That's a girlfriend. She's lucky enough to have a boyfriend, this because she's blonde and not middle-aged. <laughs> Bitter much? But the coolest thing she has, by far, is, well, what do you think? What do you remember? The Roadster, the blue Roadster. The Roadster, my friends, in my mind, is much more than a car. And isn't it really, if you're a girl who loves your car? I mean, and it's a type of car. It's not a minivan, snore. It's not an SUV like I drive, so sensible, so sensible. It's a roaster, man. You can drive it anywhere. Your hair will blow around. Even if you've got a blowout, it won't even matter. You're gorgeous. You're adventurous. You're bold. I think that roadster goes back to the 50s. This is the part where you tell me that you know what the hell I'm talking about. When I say, see the USA in your Chevrolet. Yes, America. It's Bruce Springsteen and Thunder Road. Let the wind blow back your hair. Cars are not just cars for American, goddammit. They're freedom, they're adventure, they're boldness, they're resourcefulness. They're, your life is laid out ahead of you. Just get in and drive and drive fast. In the driver's seat, ladies. This in a time when you think about the best-selling writers were people like Earl Stanley Gardner, who wrote Perry Mason, great as he was, but Della Street wasn't driving anything. She was pouring coffee. So, enter me on my first divorce. And basically, I have to find another way to make a living because I had been a lawyer and I loved it. But when my beautiful daughter was born, I'm like, somebody's got to take care of this kid. And, all right, I'll say this. It was in the 80s. Do you remember the 80s in Dress for Success? They made us wear ties, like you were supposed to wear ties. And in those days, if you stay at home with your kid, you were like a freak. Man, I, I remember you could have delivered a child crossing the stage, like, oh. What was that? Somebody has to take care of that, and it better not be me. Like, you weren't even allowed to want to stay home, but I wanted to stay home. And I said, all right, now you have to find another way to make a living. You've always, and then I said, well, I've always been an English major. I'm a bookaholic. I'm the kid on the library floor who loved Nancy Drew. And by the way, where, where is Nancy Drew now? There are lots of books get written, and they're wonderful. But the fact is, I wasn't seeing a lot of in mystery, in our genre, which I love. I happened to be past president last year of Mystery Writers of America. I'm profoundly concerned with its development, but I can tell you 20 years ago, particularly in legal thrillers, there were, the women were not the stars. And I said, this is sad, this has to change. So a little pushy broad that I am, I'm gonna try and change this. Doesn't work out that way so easy. There follows five years of rejection, living on credit cards, favorite rejection letter from a New York agent who said, if I, I don't have time to take any clients, but if I did, I wouldn't take you. I see that guy every year at Book Expo. I'm like, remember me, dude? Because I remember you. And I will never, all right, I'm over it. it makes me sweat. So I start to write those books. Finally, they get published which is a miracle. I pay back the debt. This is not a bad, bad luck story. I mean, I really feel profoundly lucky to be standing for you. And then you sort of go, well, now what are you going to write about, Scott Alini? You know, you got a job now. And the answer, you know, when people say, where do you get your ideas? For me, everybody writes their own books. 
regardless of genre or whether they're genreless or they say transcends a genre, which is supposed to be a compliment. And I'm like, I don't need you to say that about me. I like the genre just fine. But the truth is, they all come from my heart. They all come from something personal in my life. Right? Even if it's wacky or even if it's normal, because my, my, the great, I think, assumption, everybody who writes fiction or even nonfiction like I do memoir, is that my life isn't that different from your life. That's why people come to these pavilions, because that's what books are. They connect us one to the other because we recognize ourselves. That's why I'm joking around that I'm talking about myself, but I really think I'm talking about you. Why I wanted these women in these books is because I wanted you to see yourself doing all the cool, amazing, strong things women do, starting with giving birth, which is a hell of a lot harder than graduating law school or all the amazing, talented things you do today. And I said, I want to see that represented. But it has to be a story with, yes, let's hear it for us, damn it. <laughs> but it has to be a story with a heart. So I'll tell you a quick story. One day, it was a memory. Sometimes books come from a memory. I'm walking down the street with my mother in South Philadelphia. I was young, about seven, months, seven, seven years old. I remember a pink car pulling up to the curb actually a convertible. And the woman at the wheel looks over at my mother, and my mother says, oh, watch this. And so my mother starts to walk over to the car from the curb. The woman driver, this is the old days, cranks the window up in my mother's face with this look of ferocity I've never seen on anyone who's not a felon. My mother is laughing. She comes back to the curb. I said, who was that? She said, that was my sister. This is a true story. This is an Italian family. Although I'm guessing it's not confined. And sure enough, I who had been taught to be really love my family, say, well, how come, are you serious? And that's an aunt, that's your Aunt Lena. We don't speak. We haven't spoken in 17 years. Why? Because, this is where you're gonna get really impressed. Ready? Come close. Because she brought a gun to a wedding. Oh yeah, baby, my family is a mini-series. <laughs> now, long story short, as I go and I, I when this occurs to me, like at one point in my life about 10 years ago, I go, what's up with it? Because of, I, in my family, tomato sauce and blood are very thick. So to have an aunt that I don't know, who we never spoke to, who sadly went to her grave with that much moxie, and could also, you know, handle a firearm, I'm curious. So I ask all my family, and ha this is what, what I learn when you talk to your crazy family. Half of them tell me she didn't bring a gun to a wedding, she brought it to a Holy Communion. <laughs> and then the rest tell me it was a wedding. They see this as a big difference. <laughs> the only I difference I see is that at the Holy Communion, the wine takes a little longer to come out, but it comes out. Although it's not an open bar, not in my family. So I said, that's a book. What is going on with this family? And I realized that when I talked to all these older relatives, they had, even though they were born in this country, they had the kind of mindset that they were raised in, which was distinctly Italian, of the variety, unfortunately, of fascist Italy. So we live in America, where if you call 911, guys come and save you. Well, they grew up in a, in a time, in a place, where the cops were thugs, where the government was criminals. Their world was topsy-turvy. And so they distrust all authority and all law. And what I learned from my crazy relatives in the absence of law, that people make law. And in the crazy law of the Flying Scottolinis, if you brought a gun to a wedding, we would never talk to you again. <laughs> and that became The Vendetta Defense, which is a book I wrote a while ago. And now you know, it happens to be about a, a young, normal, read, not Italian, uh, a natural blonde, I stretched for you. And she is going to represent an Italian immigrant who thinks not all killing is murder, and she has to try to prove it. Right? We have other stories. All, the core of it is something emotional that means something to me. It has to, to power it and give, I think my books are alive that way. And so it has to really be meaningful. Not always happy. Um, but more, more ordinary occasion. Here's the here's situation. I have this daughter I love, we write together. Now, 
it's hard, as you know, especially as I'm a single parent. I mean, it was a weird ex existence this poor kid had, because basically, from the third month of her life, I was single. So you can imagine that's part of the reason I stayed home to raise her, because I knew she was going to have a little bit of a weird road to hoe. The proof was that when she went to the first week of kindergarten, and they did that show and tell, we call it show and tell, they call it some dopey name, sharing, <laughs> telling, telling everything your parents don't want to tell. She came home from her first week of school and said, Mom, do you know that there are kids in my class and the mommy and the daddy live in the same house? Said, That's disgusting. I, what is this country coming to? So smart. So basically, what was the point of that story? Oh, so what I can tell you is, I have a hard time letting go of my kid. The joke about Italian mothers is, what is the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? And the answer is, eventually, a Rottweiler lets go. We don't let go easy. I mean, I had to stop nursing and everything. All right, I'll stop. In any event, you get the idea. So one day, I am at college, when she was in college a while ago, and if you've had this experience, where you're packing all of your daughter's belonging into a car, right? And girls have stuff, shoes, earrings, DVDs, clothes, more clothes, also eyeliners, things like that, right? The boys, they have a basketball. I was like, what? It's like three o'clock and you're done? We'd be there cramming everything in the car. We crammed everything in the car, we're gonna drive home, and we finally lashed to the top of the car. A mattress, a box, a box spring, and her red rug, which she adores. We have to keep this rug. This rug costs $37. I'm like, all right. We put it on top of the car. We start driving down I-95 from Boston to Philly. We are in Connecticut when the mother of all thunderstorms begins. Red is leeching all over mother's beautiful white car. It looks like a blood mobile. <laughs> Seriously, it does. I'm not kidding. You know how red things never stop bleeding? You watch it, they say, oh, after the second time, it will never stop. This was a cheap ass rug and it was not. We look like Stephen Kling, like, like plasma running down. It was horrifying. People looking and pointing, and we look at each other, and we just start laughing, because it's so silly and stupid. And we laugh all the way home. And of course, me having, well, waning supplies of estrogen. By the time I get home, I'm like, what we Italians say is verklempt, right? Because I'm realizing that I'm not going to have a lot more times like this with my kid where I have her captive in the car, she has to tell me stuff. <laughs> then I'm gonna have to really let her go when she graduates, and how the hell am I gonna do that? And I reach the door, all emotional, <laughs> and I realized then that I said, you know, you're going, thinking about this the wrong way. You think you have to let her go, and that's the wrong question. As we lawyers know, you have the wrong issue. When you say the question is you have to let her go is the assumption that you own her and you do not, friend. You're her mother, you got to be lucky, you got to have her, and you could sometimes borrow her shoes, though you cannot walk in them. <laughs> but you don't own her. She's not yours to let go. And as soon as I thought that, I was like, that is a genuine friggin' insight. That would be a literary term. <laughs> if you have any questions, please feel free to ask soon. And I got home and I said, that's a book. That book was Look Again. If you read the book, bottom line, this, oh, thank you. Story is, a woman comes home, right? She's a single mother of an adopted child. She gets in the mail one of those, have you seen this child circulars? And she recognizes the kid in the middle. It's her kid. As far as she knows, it was a lawful adoption. And you know, as a smart reader, what is she gonna do? Because right away you know, is she gonna tell what happened and lose the child? Or is she gonna keep this terrible secret and keep the child? The question and look again is who really owns a child? And the inspiration is the filthy red rug. <laughs> and then we come to more recent, because I think what I've sort of been exploring, ironically, since Francesca has moved out and grown up and you know, done that, I've thought more about motherhood and I've actually turned to more about parenthood. So the next book, which is coming out in April, is called Don't Go. And for the first time ever, 
I wrote a male lead. I know. I know. It's not that I've had more dates, but I've had more fantasies. Yes, fantasies, everybody. And look, but the story, in short, is about a guy, God bless him, who, who goes to Afghanistan. He's a military doctor. I'm very interested in that and all the good those guys do and women. And basically, his wife dies while he's away. I won't tell you under just circumstances because there is a mystery there. And when he gets home, though, he has to ask himself the question that I ask myself sometimes, because I always put things in terms of what is it to be a mother? But the real hard question is what is it to be a parent? And as someone who had a very close relationship with my late father, he was a pretty good mother for a father. And so that's the question I wanted to ask and don't go. It's, you know me, if you read me, I try to always keep it fresh. That's why I wrote Standalones, and that's why I'm actually bringing Rosado and Associates back every summer. Thank you, they will be back. I'm writing it now, uh, called The Accused. It's a Mary D'Annunzio book. So I'm gonna do two novels a year, and the funny books with Francesca. This will guarantee that I have no social life. But at least I'm doing something productive while I'm home whining. <laughs> and, and that's really the stuff of it. I think that if you are right, and I'll turn it over for questions in a minute, but I think if you are really drawing on these experiences, certainly not everybody has a family feud, but everybody knows what it's like to let go of a child. And I don't think it's a process that ends at college or even when they walk down the aisle. And if you ha even, that's why I think the genres are kind of meaningless because you are always writing about something that is heartfelt. And if you really write with an open heart, that's why it's no stretch to write nonfiction and tell you everything about my silly personal life or my bunions or my facial hair that sprouts gray. Yes, I am turning into an Amish man before your eyes. Aren't we ladies and how much does that suck? Another literary term, look at all your learning. That the point is, I really have to tell the truth, even if it makes me cringe, especially if it makes me cringe. If I'm really writing about something that matters, it's not something I really want to explore, but I will. And I think that's what I hope connects in my books, and I will get, venture to say it connects in the books of all of these authors here. You have to really bust yourself to a certain extent. And the proof of that is readers like you, and more and more, where there's so many more people reading. The, the perfect point of this, and the perfect proof when I'll end, is book clubs. Book clubs, I will tell you, as someone who studies this stuff, the number of book clubs are through the roof. Isn't that an interesting phenomenon? At the same time, our, our work is more compartmentalized, we're atomized, we're in different places, we telecommute, we work part-time. It's not the way it used to be 20 years ago when I was a lawyer, and we all worked nine to whatever, and we all knew each other, and we all went to the same place. We still seek that connection. That's why I love that they have this book festival because it makes a statement, and look, I'm a big fan of children's books, but can I just say that adults need nurturing too? We need that healing. We need that connection one to the other. We need to be reminded of our common bonds as people who just walk on the face of the earth in this place and time. I think books do that. I think that is the highest and best use of fiction. That's why I write. I write to connect with you. If you've read me, you knew I was gonna be like this. If you haven't, welcome. And welcome to the festival and enjoy tomorrow as well. Thank you very, very much. Do we have time for questions or do we not have time for questions? 10 minutes for questions. I will answer anything, ask me anything. You know everything about me and that's what I love about you. Yes, please. I want to thank you for a book that isn't mentioned in here that I loved terrifically, which is My Third Husband Will Be a Dog. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. 
You know, it's really funny. The genesis of that, I'll tell it briefly. I was at a, I was at a library fundraiser in Laguna Niguel, California, which is like a really cool place, right? Now, I will tell you that I joke about being divorced twice, but honestly, I'm not really proud of it. And I don't always lead with it. And I happen to sort of mumble it. And then the woman in California said, you're only divorced twice, I'm divorced four times. And then this other one, I'm divorced six times. And we, I'm like, I need to catch up. <laughs> I need to get married and divorced real quick. Now, why this matters is we start talking, and as I start to talk to these women who are talking about their divorces, we start to talk about our dogs for some reason, and I start to understand that there's a relationship between the number of divorces and the number of dogs, and that's kind of true in my own life, because I have like four dogs and only two divorces. So the point is, I said, I want to start writing about that, and I had also missed somebody else, Irma Bombeck, right? So I went to the Philadelphia Inquirer in brief, and I said, can I write some funny stories about the life of a woman who happens to find herself, through no fault of her own, on her own? I can't be alone. There's lots of divorced people, there's lots of widowed people, or there's just people who just like, might want to read, and they're like, okay, go for it. And now I write them with my daughter. So Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog was the first book. The new one, which is coming out next month, with, with, which I wrote with Francesca Saratella, my daughter, is called, which a title she thought of and I love, Meet Me at Emotional Baggage Claim. <laughs> and another one, Best Friends, Occasional Enemies, is out in paperback, you can get it anytime. And they're all funny stories about our life as mothers and daughters, because we love each other even though we fight. So thank you for what you said. Yes, please. Um, I think he's next. You're next, sir. Um, yeah, I was going to ask uh, your process of becoming published, of getting various decline letters, and then uh, eventually cultivating relationships with literary agents, publicists, and um, having someone actually believe in your ideas and the practical like marketing aspects right. of publishing a book. Okay, so the question is how to get published and how does it work? And I will tell you, I'll tell it briefly, but honestly, if you go to my website, I have videos all about that. But the truth is, I didn't know anybody. I don't have any connection. I just wanted to do what I told you. So I got a copy of Literary Marketplace at the library and went through and sent it to agents until they stopped rejecting me. I didn't cultivate anybody, and nobody cultivated me. And it, you, it can be done that way. And I really would encourage you, if you want to write me, I will email you back about it and to help you if I can. How so many please, uh, rejections did you get before you were A finding? countless number. And I... I was going to put them up on the website, but there were so many. <laughs> Don't listen to the rejections. Just keep writing. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your writing process. Are you an outliner? Do you write by the seat of your pants? And what's your schedule? Seat of my pants. All right. <laughs> I am the woman who had a baby as her marriage was falling apart. I am not a good planner. I'm not. I'm here to say you can still survive. Woohoo! Let's hear it for a kamikaze lifestyle. I. Yeah! Yes! Chaos and disorder! We'll live. I have an idea, and I've told you the genesis of those ideas. As soon as I understood the idea was going to be, let's say, look again, I sat down and said, what would you do if you were that woman? Because that woman's always some variation of me, which is just some variation of you, only shorter. And that's my process. I just crank it out. I try to do 2,000 words a day. I work all the time, seven days a week, but I feel very lucky and blessed and grateful to have this job. So do it however you want. There's wonderful books on writing. Stephen King wrote a wonderful one. Uh, Annie Lamott, Bird by Bird, is another wonderful one. But just do it. If you finish a manuscript, you get to write me an email, and I will show it to my agent. Thanks. Think about it. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Last question. I, uh, I'm just reading your book uh, that you wrote with your daughter, Best Friends, Occasional Enemies. Yay, thank you for that. You're welcome. And um, I love it because it, I feel like you, it really sounds like my mother and I, except the one thing is we could never work together on writing in any sense. Not that she's the writer in the family I am. She will send me things and say, edit this. But she'll <laughs> argue with me about the edits. Good and for so her. Argue. I'm wondering, how do you work together and survive? Well, I'd love to pull her up here, but you know. Um, the answer is, first off, thank you for saying that. We really, I really want that in the, in the ether, just those images of mothers and daughters who are really great friends. That doesn't mean you don't fight. It doesn't mean you don't drive each other nuts. It doesn't mean there's times you go, I, I wanted custody. I mean, there's times. 
I'm only kidding. It's gonna be a long ride home in that car. <laughs> but the fact is, and I love her to death, and she's super talented, and she, we don't write together, and that's what I love about those books. First off, look at me. I don't, everybody worries. I don't care about like privacy and stuff. I think the more open you are, the better you get. And the, and the closer you are to people. So I just write about what I think about things that when we have a fight, or when we don't have a fight, or how much we love each other and how silly we can be. And she writes her columns or stories in the books in New York. I don't review them first. She doesn't look at mine first. And I think that's the value of those books because people, a lot, with mothers my age say, that's exactly what my daughter's like. And people your age go, it's exactly what my mother's like. And ain't it great? <laughs> so the process is really just let it rip. And I'm a big fan. Look, I get all excited when I come to Washington because of that needle and all these things that maybe you guys are more used to seeing, but it kind of gets me jazzed. And not the politics, more the fundamentals of what the country was built on. And my favorite amendment is the First Amendment. I love the whole notion in this country that we don't like censorship, but we like argument. We like disagreement. We like different views that said out loud and hammered together will achieve reason and intimacy and love. That's what I think those books do. So thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.